Welcome everyone and hi, I'm Chris Dobbin and I welcome you to the Amplify Your Brand series where I we talk about the ultimate in live branding and powerful brands today and along with my friend and fellow branding expert you can see on the screen with me or you'll be listening to later, Samoa, we're here to show you the expertise and help you take your brand to the next level. Whether you're an entrepreneur, a small business owner, a marketing professional or someone who's looking to launch their, their new brand, uh, like a personal brand, this is packed with practical insights and strategies that will help you amplify your brand and stand out in that digital landscape. So please get ready, please take some notes, take what we talk about and learn it and put it into action because by the end of this live stream, you'll have a clear roadmap of how your brand resonates with a audience. And obviously we would look forward to talking to you now about the next step we're gonna take in amplifying your brand. And this week we have decided to add to the topic of cracking the code and discovering the problems your brand can solve. So Sim, talk to me why we picked this topic and why we're going down this pathway today. <laughs> Very simply because it's the most practical way to approach developing a brand. No brand exists without a problem. And uh, if you want to solve problems, you will need to identify those problems in your niche, in your audience, in the people that you serve and um, be able to speak to those problems so you can position yourself as a problem solver. Exactly. Yeah. So one thing that most is really common in a lot of businesses is they have a great idea and yeah. they then think that idea is all that they need to be successful. Where branding comes into that idea's sort of life cycle is it starts to help them to identify who this idea is good for and how you communicate that better, whether that be visual through words, through audio, visual, whichever way it is the way to communicate or even placing that brand in the right spot so that the people that can see it, see it and react to it and respond the way you want them to respond. As we've talked about in previous episodes, your brand is owned by the customer. It's not owned by you. You do your best to communicate what you want it to do and the, get the perception in the places it needs to be. But ultimately, the person receiving the communication decides whether your brand's likable, lovable, viable, you know, referable, whatever the scenarios are. So. We're going to go through a few steps today on what that is all about and i hope you can enjoy us on this journey journey and if you've got any feedback along the way we would always love to hear from you so if you've got a way to message us uh please do that and we look forward to getting back to you whenever we can and uh talking about those things that you've raised but uh let's get on to the presentation and what we will talk about is the simple fact is we are still uh, in our yellow section of our P8 platform when we've been doing these um, episodes lately. And we are now moving on to what we call the problem section of developing your brand. So everything we talk about today will be revolving around the problem section of our P8 model system. And if you would like to know more about that, again, please reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you about how this program we've developed in this framework allows us to amplify your brand and get it out there in a way that maybe you haven't thought about branding in in the past so problem 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 uh, we'll move <laughs> to the next slide i think you've opened up what we talked about let's talk about obviously researching your audience so we got we begin by researching and understanding our clients uh, so your target audience we identify the demographics of psychiatrics and the needs desires and pain points that you know your potential clients' challenges are. We look at the research that can involve market analysis, surveys, interviews, focus groups, and studying, obviously, your competitors, because there's no use going out there and then finding out your competitors using, in this case, on the screen there, you can see yellow, and then you go out as a yellow brand as well. You don't have any differentiation there, So there are, which we talked about in a previous uh, live stream. So do you want to talk to me about this? Because I think you've got something you would love to show on the screen there, Sim, about researching your audience. And Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. What you started out uh, today's session, uh, the distinction that you um, explained so well, Chris, is that your business is owned by yourself, your brand is owned by your audience. This is what the definition of a brand is, is to create a or carve a position in your audience's mind. So hence why we keep saying that your brand, unlike most assume, is actually owned by your audience and it's to your audience that it needs to cater. With that in mind, where do, does your audience talk about their problems? This is what mm. the first point is about. So there's a, a number of ways of going about this. And there's a number of free ways, a number of time consuming ways, and not a number of paid ways. Let's start with the most immediate things for anybody trying to understand how to conduct research and actually have a feel 
for what the problems that are being stated in your audience's mind come up in anywhere, uh, mostly online, but also offline. So networking is a great way of going about this concept. There are a number of research tools, and there's um, some of them we'll cover them today. Mm. We're talking about tools like uh, Google Keyword Planner. The SEM Rush uh, tool is very useful. Online forums and communities are extremely valuable so that it, um, we can go and get, and get a, an actual finger on the pulse of the audience. So when you engage in, for example, social media platforms and especially groups, especially groups that have a theme or a business group, you will find a lot of information uh, goes through those, those groups. A way to filter that information is actually use the search tools inside those groups to look for solutions that you have or that your business offer mm -hmm. and how it comes home with the way they're expressed by the people that you may want to serve. So for example, in a Facebook group, for us, if we're talking about visual identities or logo designs or stuff that uh, pertains to what we offer as products and services, and services, we go into the yep. groups, look in the search terms and type in to see what comes out. And if you follow those threads, you'll eventually find more refined ways, or at least the audience's ways of expressing the problem for which you are a solution for, for what your brand offers a solution. Specifically, um, with, with those uh, keywords, there's a number of ways you can then use those keywords to create your demonstration of being able to solve that, that problem for them. Talking about, um, the again, staying in, in the online realm, we have ways of um, assessing those, those problems and conducting online surveys. surveys. Uh, SurveyMonkey is a really useful tool. Google Forms is a, a very useful tool as well. Um, Typeform, and there's levels to how much you need to invest, but all of these have a basic free plan that you can use to get started and get warmed up with. The one that I want to show you today is also free, and it's also very, very useful because when you find numbers, a, a, a number of specific search terms and problems that you can identify with names and keywords, you're going to be able to run these keywords, which will then lead you to how you present your solution. Let me show you what that looks like. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you can understand what I mean by all this. So hopefully you can see what's on my screen. And we're going into this tool, very useful, which is called answerthepublic.com. I've already put in a search term that applies to us, for example, because myself, I design a lot of visual identities. I use that search term to run an Australian-based search and see what comes up for information. And the first thing that we see here is the search volume and the cost per click. This tells us whether or not this, uh, this search term is being actively searched online and how much it would be um, necessary to invest in, in case we wanted to uh, go with a, a campaign, a cost per click campaign. Now, this is the interesting part. Visual identity <laughs> returns a number of ways that this term, these two words are being searched online. The amazing part about this tool is that it breaks it uh, down in a visual way and literally gives us the search terms being used that allow us to then answer to those search terms in the, in the various types of content. That could be your blog posts, that could be your articles, that could be your videos, that could be uh, any which way that you create content to position your brand and your solutions to that problem in, in any which way you wanna start with. Let's talk about the how, let's talk about the who, let's talk about the what, the are, the why, the when, the can. It is an amazing tool and I recommend that you give it a whirl because like I said, it's free and it's very, very quick to use. Answer the public.com and you can go deeper and deeper and find so many ways of using this tool to your advantage. So I'll just leave it here for now and hopefully you will have gotten that 
that tool, uh, once again, answerthepublic.com. It's one of the ways that you have to use the terms that are being searched by audience and create solutions for that audience's paint. <clears throat> That's point and, number one. <laughs> yeah, it is. But, I mean, the, the beauty of where we, the, I guess the age we live in right now is that we have advantages that a lot of businesses before us didn't have, which is they used to have to use gut feel, word of mouth, and they really had like maybe whatever was on TV, radio, or in magazines to kind of understand what's going on. Um, we have these tools like the ones you've just highlighted there where you can go global from the day you have that idea and try and work out what's going on and see what's trending. So um, there's no excuse for you to not have this market research done by the time you're having a chat to even someone like ourselves to understand, you know, is your idea a good yeah. one? Is it already out there? Yeah. What, what are people saying about it? You should be able to use whatever's online to actually help you go through that. Uh, and then you can still do what we were talking about, the old school of looking at what's on uh, TV, radio, and magazines and word of mouth and have a chat to people and get that feedback. Yeah. So that is one excellent way to cracking the code of how to solve problems with your branding and the brand problems that you solve. Um, so uh, where are we? This is it, that one there. So that was the first point. The second point we're going to talk about today is identifying your customers pains um, and based on research that we've obviously talked about previously you're going to make a list of these problems and challenges that your clients target audience face these could be unmet needs frustration obstacles or pain points that prevent them from achieving their desired outcome or living their ideal lives so do you want to talk to that one yes i wouldn't mind sharing my thoughts and my experiences on that um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Business owners many times have a self-prescribed symptom or they make assumptions. Has most of us will have been a technician of a specific area in the past. We then try to assume that our experience in the technician role of that position we had in the past will be the answer to people's solutions. But the big gap here for us is understanding, again, what that looks like from a, a client or a potential client's perspective and be able to test our own assumptions and be willing to admit that we're not going about it in the best possible way. So what I'm talking about is, is self-diagnosed problems. And um, to give you a, a quick example, many people or many business owners complain that can be, they cannot be found online. This is a self-prescribed problem that you, or for example, an agency like ourselves would need to translate into something that relates to a product that we offer. If somebody cannot be found online in today's world, it's not lack of information. It's being able to couple this, the, the information with the locale or with the geographic area or with the service and making it find itself in such a way that the main uh, search terms being used on Google and Facebook and, and the platforms online marry up to the point of them, be, uh, the, the client being able to find this service. So it's not that people can't find you. It's that you haven't probably developed a good Google My Business page strategy or you don't have your social media uh, marrying up with keywords that are relevant to the people that want to find you, that want the solution that you have to offer. And this is where um, many people fall in the, in, in the mistake of trying to advertise way too soon before they refine their message and are able to create the pain point and solution connection. Was that yeah. clear? It is, but I'll go even further with this to sort of highlight another way of approaching that is a lot of people, if like Apple came out with their latest device and said it's got all these amazing things like the features and the, um, the, the, you know, the speed it does, the, the, the amount of hard drive it's got. <laughs> the megabytes of storage. All, all that stuff, right? There are some geeks out there that would go, that's fantastic or pick that apart or whatever. But their actual target audience is a typical family consumer type person. They care about, is it going to make my life easier? Are you going to save me time? Is it going to be cost effective? Am I going to have an, you know, an enjoyable experience? That's why 
you know, like if you're using Apple or any of these kind of businesses in that kind of corporate environment, they never really talk about the actual product. They talk about the feelings and the emotions and the benefit you're going to get out of getting that problem solved. And that's the biggest mistake a lot of small businesses make is they really want to get so excited about what they can do, them, I can do for you, yep. Yep. instead of what yep. you're going to do for them, whoever you're talking to. So don't think problem in the way that we've kind of highlighted there. It's like, think about it the way that I've just highlighted right now is that you've got to really understand that it's what's in it for them, not what's in it for you. Because correct, you might look at the, from a business point of view, you might say, I'm going to make $10 off every sale. And that's a good profit margin. But it's got it for you, for you to get that $10. You've got to highlight to somebody that that $10 is worth spending to get an outcome or a benefit. That's what really it is all and about. And it's, yes. And especially if those $10 solve a, a problem or an existing pain to your customer. Sticking with uh, Chris's example, Apple. Um, yeah. Sorry, the Chris's example, Apple, the product that they had that was the most wonderful brand statement that solved this solution was the um, was the um, the iPod. iPod. Carry thousands of songs in your pocket. That's a brilliant way of saying we have 512 megabytes of storage in a device that you can uh, peruse with your finger, runs through a database of music and uh, catalogs your entire um preferences in a practical way <laughs> yeah. so exactly. they just can encapsulate it everything in that i spent yeah. 15 seconds describing in one single sentence that solved the pain of carrying around music in quantity and that <laughs> form of communication and branding and understanding your audience mm -hmm. is an example of where they didn't they were not the first mp3 player on the market they were very late into that but they were the best at communicating what its benefits and what problems it solved than anyone else. Absolutely. Um, so Absolutely. great example. Where everything we've just talked about has led to is this next component that I'm going to highlight, um, which is the fact that now that you've identified the problems you've got, you've got to prioritize them. So we might go off and do all that fantastic research, evaluate the list of problems, and we've got to then now prioritize them based on their significance of impact on the target audience. So you've got to focus on the problem that is the most relevant and pressing uh, issue for your customer. So everything we just talked about then with the Apple solution is a great example of that, where they went, you know what, there's, there's a, a thousand features on our uh, tool, uh, the MP3 player. There's so many things it does. But what it does is it puts those thousand things in your pocket <laughs> and it's like <laughs> hang on a second that was so easy for me to understand because i know what it's like to put something in my pocket and it's a small little area and a thousand sounds like a big number it just has lots of ways to have impact with a really like you said 15 words or less and you're having impact um because it's Absolutely. visual it's audio it's it's got a whole bunch of really fantastic ways it says problem solved so you you can't always be Apple, uh, and we are appreciating that in this conversation. That not everybody has either the 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 product or the the uh, I guess the resources and things like that. But when they work with us, that is what we try to help you identify, so that you know you can get to the crux of that problem. You prioritize them, work out which ones are great, because a lot of our clients are really passionate about their product, and they will go, "It does this, it does this, it does this, it does this," and they're just rattling them off. Technical, but, technical, technical, technical. <laughs> most times they are, but um, there are times when we do our clients that we do get the customers and we don't have to say, oh, those 18,000 ideas are fantastic, but we actually only need two or three. It, at best, can we get one um, that we're going to focus on and just nail that one? Because if you can do that, and then obviously as we're nailing that one, we want to make sure it's not something your competitor is doing, but we'll get into that later. It's just identifying that, you need to simplify your message. You need to prioritize the problems you solve because as humans, like in the marketing of, of the brand, you need to get this down to under three things. It is scientifically proven that if you start adding a fourth problem, a fifth problem that you solve, having more problems to solve, all of a sudden our human brain starts to go, that sounds complicated. That sounds scary. It sounds like way too much work, too much effort and it becomes harder. So being able to solve lots of problems isn't actually the best approach to branding. Solving the best problem and the minimal amount of problems that people can bite size and take on 
will help you do a better job at branding. And that's another little guess, guess tip we've got here for cracking the code of branding. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So the next one is define the solutions and match them. So for each problem identified, brainstorm potential solutions that you, you can offer. Consider how the product or the service can be addressed, the specific pain point that your challenge is faced by your target audience, and focus on the value propositions, the benefits your client's solution brings to the table. Do you want to talk to that one? Why benefits are yes, better than features? I'm <laughs> I'm going to, if you haven't had made that point yet, but yeah, I think you did a, a spectacular job of that. I'm going to tie in point number one, point number two, and bring us to number four. So on point number one, we talked about target audience. Uh, this is another way of saying your demographics, your audience. So <clears throat> to facilitate this process, uh, this process of uh, matching the problems to your, to your audience, in the point number one, ideally you would have your primary uh, audience or your primary customer and and after that you have the secondary customer and the third eventually tertiary customers this is the way um, you can uh, help yourself understand who you're talking to mostly and then you have uh, secondary tertiary types of problems that come up and how to marry them so we talked about as well the the, the demographics uh, and associated those problems. And in point number four, I, I really want to make it very clear that if you have to diagram and visually build something that makes sense to you so you can understand how to develop the best possible solutions, uh, one way of going about it is actually print out and assign personalities to your demographics, to your audiences. Let's say you have Jack uh, up on, on the first um, on the first type of client, you have uh, Mary on the second, and the third could be your generic uh, type of customer. If you identify Jax's main problems and pains and are able to marry it up with the solutions that your brand offers, you'll have a much more um, refined way of investing in the right solutions so that you can answer Jack's problems and then marrying the secondary sets of problems that come with Mary's lifestyle or problems and pains that she feels, and the same with the tertiary. Because like we just mentioned before, technically you may be able to solve all those problems, but you need to position them in a way that becomes relevant in a cascading order and are able to create messaging and craft your brand positioning around the first, the second, and the third. Because if you're really good at a core product that comes up in the third in your research, it's not, not real useful for you or your clients. You're doing them a disservice by not putting the, the most pressing pain that they have, even if that's a very small but very evident and, and very easy to solve uh, problem up first with your first type of customer. I hope that makes sense. It does. Um, and I'll use Pepsi as an example in this uh, scenario where Pepsi and Coca-Cola, Pepsi lose out consistently on a, on a bunch of areas around Coca-Cola, not because they're in the products worse or better or any of those kind of things. It's just the, the way that Coca-Cola does their messaging. But what's unique and I think one of the best things that Pepsi have ever done is they've always said it's about the taste. And what this does is it makes the person think, I need to actually try that because I can't just take their word for it. I've got to try it. It's just human curiosity. We've got to have a sip of it to see whether that's the thing I want. So, and then they make that choice. And now they're obviously a bit Pepsi in their scenario are hoping that getting someone off the Coca-Cola and onto their Pepsi uh, product is going to actually taste better and they're going to get that audience. But it's a unique way that they've gone about saying, taste is our problem we solve you're going to enjoy the taste experience better try it out and so it's interestingly it's enough very very good example there chris interestingly enough pepsi has researched that there's a correlation between the amount of sugar and how we perceive taste and this is mm. why they developed their tagline around taste and they ran so many campaigns filmed campaigns documented campaigns where they run tests of other cola products versus the Pepsi, and usually the sugary version, which is usually Pepsi, will win out over the other uh, the other yeah. uh, competitors. This is and, the work um, of research. Yeah, uh, there's an amazing um, uh, uh, show on um, 
Netflix at the moment about the guy that tried to um, game the system of getting a, a jet fighter out of Pepsi. And what's really <laughs> unique about that is when they were interviewing all the Pepsi staff members, they actually did the uh, blind test of Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And yep. it was really funny how many of the Pepsi people got it wrong. Oh, like they, they went, oh, oh that's so much better. They're going, Shh, oh, don't tell me I've just chosen. <laughs> <laughs> I have to look so, it up. I just made a note. I'm going to look it up tonight uh, because I want, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in this jet yeah, fighter. So there's a, a kid um, in, the, um, in the early 90s that gamed the system and uh, wanted to win a jet fighter. Uh, and it was it was big news. It was like, uh, yeah, watch it. It's a fantastic show, and it's done really, really well. I was really, really impressed with it. But uh, check that one out. But it's another totally off topic with what we're talking about today. So let's get back on to topic. Bring it back and... on topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's, let's bring it back on topic and validate and just... the solution. <laughs> <laughs> So evaluate and refine the potential solution. So consider factors such as whether it's feasible, whether it's competitive, does it differentiate, does it align with your client's brand values? So validate the solution by testing them with your target audience through either, as we've touched on earlier, surveys, focus groups, prototypes, or feedback to refine this further. Do you want to talk to that one? Oh, why could I, could I even? Um, Experience-based, this is one of the best surveys you can run. Walk a mile in your client's shoes. Yes. I say this because it's applicable. It is the beginning of a valid research process, and it will give you the best insights that, that online could ever give you. Because online is going to be statistically an average of a something that came up, and together it was, it was mishmashed into this average that I'm talking about. One of the best ways to this day that it, it, it involves time and it involves your understanding of those first steps in the process of researching. But one of the best ways that I found to truly get from the, from the uh, horse's mouth, the expression I was looking for, um, what the problem truly is, go walk a mile in your client's shoes. In my early days of working at a very big company, uh, our clients were the marketing departments. And at, at some point, um, I just needed to understand better the mindset of the market marketers I was working with so that I could mm. provide the creatives that allowed them to fulfill the briefs they gave me that I sometimes had problems interpreting. So I would ask my creative director to spend a morning with such and such marketer in such and such country that was developing a campaign. This actually mm. worked out so well that... Um, I was able to understand what my audience, that marketer, wanted from that brief and understood that the language being used written in a written format um, broke up in a different way. When I spent some time sitting by this person, looked at the statistics they were evaluating to formulate that brief and was able to um, create better responses in more timely uh, ways to fulfill those mm -hmm. briefs. So I'm not right. saying go spend a week with your client, but do, do understand that your client has a, a perspective, a filter of the world that you probably have a, in a very, very different um, light yourself. Yeah. Ask um, I, one of your yeah. ideal clients if you can spend some time with them and look at the world from their perspective. That's going to give you so much more insight. <clears throat> yeah, um, I, okay, I nice. have. No, no, seriously, I have a number of times where I've been doing things a certain way um, with my clients. And over the years, you get feedback from clients um, on why aren't you doing this, why aren't you doing this. And I've never ignored that kind of stuff. I'm always listening out for it, especially when I hear it more than once. Because generally what happens with that more than once scenario is that you probably have other clients who are experiencing the same thing. But some people are wallflowers and they won't sort of raise it or won't talk about it, but they'll... They'll tell everyone else. They won't tell you, but they'll tell everyone else. So if you do yeah. hear that happening in your business, you hear that there's certain clients have said a certain thing, be aware that it's pretty much going to be a scenario where for every one or so there's others out there and there's going to be yeah. that going on. So um, take it seriously when you do hear it. You know, if you hear it once, maybe don't worry about it. But if you're hearing it more than once, then you know that there is a problem and there, you've got to solve it. You've got to work out how to overcome that. Um, 
yeah. in, in future things. So understand what it is. So that is uh, another way to refine and validate that solution. Um, now, this is a key thing, and we love working with our clients on this, and this is what I was touching on earlier about having a great idea is just part of the journey. You now need to align that with the brand messaging. So once the solution is finalised and you align it with what your brand messaging and positioning is, you've identified that problem and solution, you've now got to craft the brand messages that highlight how the offer you're solving for that target audience problem fulfills their needs and improves their lives. So when we work with our clients, we actually look at, I guess it's it, it, this is the key word here is transformational. So we want to take someone who is in this experience to this experience and we want them to go through a particular set of set of processes to get there and if it's a one step process you're in the the i guess the the zen version of this this but most times you have to chip away at it or you have to kind of keep reminding them that this is a problem that you have and eventually what happens is it gets to a snapping point and the client goes i have to make a decision or are you're resonating with me, you get me, that's exactly what I'm going through, and they have the aha moment and transition to that. The way you do that is yeah. through messaging, whether that be visual, audio, um, through the placement, as we touched on earlier, these are the ways you do it. But it's something you have to get right, and you can't fake it to make it, because what happens is you attract, and then if you can't deliver, you're going to basically have a negative brand experience. So whatever you're doing has to be in have an integral part to it. it has to have an integrity it has to be something you can consistently deliver so that you don't have the opposite effect of attracting lots and lots of business but then losing lots of business because the experience is horrible which we've all had that experience where a brand has promised us something and we've gone and bought it or uh, gone through that experience and then come out of it going that was horrible and then word of mouth does what word of mouth does so yeah. Yeah. Correct. Is there anything else you want to add to that with a came to line in the brand? I'll back yourself up with the early example of Apple and the iPod product. Enough said. Yeah. <laughs> so there we are with number six. Now number seven in this is the communicate effective. So I guess I touched on that then. You've got to do a comprehensive comprehensive communication strategy. You've got to convey to your client that your message is going to resonate with that target audience. You're going to utilize various marketing channels and tactics such as advertising, content marketing, social media, public relations and customer support to reach and engage your audience. Now, when we mention all those things, not everybody can afford the PR person and those kind of things. So obviously we're talking about scale of economy depending on your business, but the same things apply. And because social media is available to you, it's something that is really, really cost effective and can, and can get out there. So uh, like you touched on earlier, um, Samal, jump into a group. And if that group is called um, Mums at Home, you clearly know that they're mums that don't have a job at the moment. They're probably looking after the kids and there's a whole bunch of things that come around that. So if you have a product that has allows the, the kids to sleep or be occupied or be entertained or anything like that, this is where you would go to see what the mums are saying. And then you learn from what the mums are saying. You'll notice trending keywords, things like that. You then go off and do what you were talking about earlier. You jump on um, the answerthepublic.com and have a look at that and see whether you can find some correlation between what mums are saying and what's being searched online. And bang, here we go. We've got a way to communicate better using their language. And this is another reason for doing those surveys, by the way, is if you end up with clients um or even um staff members or whatever's going on in the public and they all come back and they say a particular word whatever that word is but you can see it happening regularly throughout that you either look at that word and you go can i come up with a problem that solves that can i come up with a visual that represents that can i come up with something that makes that either look humorous or whatever my brand values are and i guarantee that communication will be a hit because you're going to put it in front of the right people who are going to see the right response to what they're feeling and they're going to go, I want to buy that, I want to get that, and you'll have a better reaction. No, Now, a lot of people are in denial. <laughs> a lot of people still aren't ready to buy, but I guarantee that they will think about it and they, when they're ready, they will come to you because that's, again, the, the power of branding is influencing that decision. And... Nowadays, more than ever before, this is where the, the chasm between what was used or the, what we used to consider as advertising and effective and today's content and long-term 
um, strategies come into play. We used to require only a couple of touch points, just only 20, 10, 20 years ago, whereas today the statistics indicate that we need at least 12 to 15 touch points before we start considering a product for a possible purchase. This comes mm. through the, the ways that we've early mentioned today. Creating content that answers and speaks to the problems that you will keep finding throughout your research is the best way to get to those specific moms that have a awake time between 2 and 4 a.m. where they get online to search a few things. That's when you need to be able to tell the right thing to the right person at the right time and do it consistently. We've given you the tools. You're going to be able to craft content that used keywords that you've researched before so that you can come up with pieces of demonstration and display of your ability. This is where your sweet spot will lie. Um, this is going back to the pitfalls that we've talked about advertising way too soon. This is where um, this is where we want to dig in. We're talking about a specific problem. Let's display in how many ways we can solve that problem in a way that appeals to those people. Instead of putting a shout out piece of uh, a billboard, a radio message, or uh, a very what is called a cold approach to try to sell this at the first time we come into touch with these people. Today's panorama in marketing and trust are deeply entrenched entrenched in, into one another if you position yourself with enough trust enough trust for long enough you will get the sale so this is where again get your branding right before you market and you advertise those are three different concepts that are still very gelled together in people's minds and where it's very easy to spend too much money way too early and be broke for the next season until we get more money. So instead of going through that cycle, which is what all of us, many of us still do, is try to invest everything in a, in a campaign and then say the same broken message a number of times out loud in a number of uh, spots, and then it falls because it produces no results. We're saying the wrong thing to the wrong people, and it's not the time to sell just yet. So look at the long-term strategy and how your content will tie into that. Exactly, yep. So obviously communicating effectively will be another way of cracking the code of your branding exercises. So the final thing we want to take on board is you've done all these seven things that we've talked about and you need to constantly monitor and iterate them. You obviously need to look at the effectiveness of them and you need to look at whether those branding, messaging and solutions actually get the feedback like we've touched on many times throughout this process, track whether those key performance indicators, the KPIs as it's referred to in many of the industries, and adapt your approach based on the insights gained. Those iterations and improvements are essential to ensure your client or your brand remains relevant and resonates with your audience over time. Um, the biggest mistake a lot of our clients go is uh, set and forget. <laughs> thanks for the logo. Thanks for the great visuals. Um, see you later. And see you later. we have had so many clients that love their brand and love what they do and then go about executing and they don't do any of these steps we're talking about right now well or effective. And it doesn't matter how good the brand looks, it's not being true to what we talked about. And so, they, they don't get the copywriter involved. They don't get the, the visual design of yourself uh, and sim in there. And they don't talk to me about where we're going to put things to get people to see it properly. And then they throw their hands in the air and go, it's not working. And the reason it's not marketing working doesn't is, work. Yeah, exactly. Marketing doesn't work. And most times it's because of they haven't taken these other seven steps we've talked about and looked at it and then tried to evaluate. Oh, hang on. I had a client one time that said, oh, my Google AdWords aren't working. And I said, oh, okay, um, let's look at your data. We looked at their data and yes, there, there was a low interaction on um, click-throughs to their website through this particular campaign. But what they weren't looking at was the calls they were getting. So their particular business was one of those businesses where people prefer to call than jump on their website, go to a form, fill in this website and send the request, right? And then they looked at the calls and we said, okay, well, what happened on this date, that time? And they went, oh, we got some business. Oh, okay, cool. Um, what about this day? Oh, got some business. Straight away, they realized that they were looking at the wrong data. They were looking at their business the wrong way. 
and the actual campaign was working really effectively. It was just they were that kind of business where picking up the phone, having a chat and getting the business was the way business was done, not jumping on a website and filling out forms. So understand your audience, understand the way you're going to take the, the sales or the KPIs, as we talked about, what actually means success. And you'll find that that's what works for you. But if you don't know what they are, you can't work out how effective this is. That's a perfect example again, Chris. Um, like you mentioned, this is not a one and done. And, and the funny thing about this is that everything in the in the example that you've mentioned was in place, but the filter changed and the type mm. of customer was not an online uh, facing kind of client. They prefer to pick up the phone and, and call and speak to somebody. This is still the way with many people, especially people over 30, 40. This is still the way that they're feeling comfortable and trust and are used, conditioned to building trust in. It's not an online cold process where you don't even know if there's anybody on the other side. You don't know if uh, the delivery is going to come. You don't know what happens to the bank that processed your payment, if you're going to have a problem. All of these maybes start building into a very big no, which just materializes into a very simple, very quick, very right now call. So understand that your message, once it's refined, you still need to, to hold against the light of what we talked about earlier before, which is what filters is the world um, creating for your for your client? Is it a visual person? Is it, uh, I want to talk to somebody, I want to talk to a human, or do I want to get this done very quickly, give me an online version, I'll swipe my card and let's go? So you understand that? and you match it with the, the brand messaging we've talked about up to this point, your problems or your clients, your audience's problems will be solved by your solution. That's right. Uh, another good example, which you're more familiar with recently that we've been through, which is uh, a client of ours was a retail client and they were saying, we really don't need a website presence. Uh, people are just coming into our store. And I said to them, well, can I have a look at your Google My Business pages? Can I look at your website data? And what we discovered was that 50% of the people who were searching for them were jumping on from the Google My Business page to their website. And the second page they were looking at was the specials page. So what this client's journey was is, I would like an offer, I would like to know what's on special, I wanna see that before I go into the store and buy that item. Now, they had nothing on their specials page. So people were getting this experience of, I'm, I'm excited, I wanna buy something, I want to go to their website. I now see that they have a specials page. I want to see specials. Yeah, they weren't offering specials. Perfect. So they were not fulfilling a audience's need and a trend. And you know, we are working with that client at the moment on this exact problem. Uh, but yes. the fact is, because of the KPI <laughs> and knowing what was going on and knowing the customer's journey, we now know this is a pathway to them getting more sales. So look at your not data. Not only that. Um, okay. Go go go. No, you go. We'll um, the 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 um, the early point that I talked about the self-prescribed symptom was not at all what what the outcome was. This client began by telling us a self-prescribed symptom: the website doesn't sell, it doesn't do anything for us, or does it? Dot dot dot. This is where Chris came in and actually looked at the visits that the specials page, specifically the landing page of the specials, was getting. And the traffic on that page alone just made up for the entire investment of having a website. And then where it broke down was the fact that the specials page was empty. And now we're solving that that, that problem uh, with the solution of having at least something populate the specials page because it's going to keep driving the same traffic. And once it connects with the specials that the uh, visitors are going to find, hopefully the problem will go away. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So um, we have done a fantastic job, Sim, of cracking the longest episode we've had to date. Uh, so we need to wrap it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so remember that branding is a interactive and ongoing uh, process. It's it's as the market evolves and customers' needs change, it's crucial to crucial to revisit this and update your clients' understandings of the problems they solve and refine your solution accordingly which I think we've done a great job at highlighting what those uh, steps are and how you can just spin and repeat these seven or eight steps we've talked about today to 
put your position of your branding and your business in a place where you're going to find more audience that want to work with you, buy your product, be serviced by you, whatever the solution is you're providing as a you know solve, solution to a problem, you will get more business. Uh, and hopefully we've helped you achieve that today. And we look forward to getting your feedback uh, on how applying these to your business has uh, increased either sales or awareness of your brand or opportunities for you. And if you are struggling with understanding what we've talked about today and you want to talk further we are more than happy to hear from you and have that conversation and see where we can apply the p8 program and the framework to what you are trying to do with your brand and cracking the code of getting it out there and solving problems so uh anything to sign off with today sim have you got some magic moments to finalize today with or am i putting you on the spot the magic was left in the 45 previous minutes chris uh, to you looking at this <laughs> To you looking at this, let us know where you're plugging in from. And if you want to share your problem with us, we'll have a start of a conversation. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys on the next one. Cool. So thanks again, guys, for joining us on the uh, live streams where we talk about amplifying your brand. Catch you next week. Thank you.